Hi, I'm Mike Ward. I want to talk to you about EVA, otherwise known as economic value added, and the stakeholder versus shareholder debate and discussion. And I want to just show you some interesting aspects that are often missed, missed because of the accounting uh, differences in all of this. So let's uh, jump in. You are familiar, I'm sure, with the constant debate about stakeholder versus shareholder model. Who, who is it we should be focused on? All, obviously, all stakeholders in a business are important, but finance tends to single out shareholders and argue that shareholders are, uh, at the, they are what we call residual claimants, as you will see, and therefore we should be focused on them. But the market is going to argue that, you know, without a customer, there is no business. The customer is king and so on. And uh, the HR people are going to say, no, it's individuals who make a company and they are our best assets and our talent. And we really need to uh, look after our staff. And the operations people are going to tell you about supply chain and without it and so on. Everybody wants a bigger stake in your business. So let's go back to some basics of accounting. Here is a picture of the income statement and we can just put in a few headings here. This is our revenue, cost of sales, our gross profit. There are a bunch of expenses obviously and we subtract all of those, we get our operating profit. Then we knock off interest, tax and we get our net income. So that's the form of the income statement which I'm sure you are familiar with. Now if we're to start asking questions about well, where are all the claims of the stakeholders we were talking about uh, shown in the business? You can see, well, let's take employees. Obviously, we're paying them wages. That's going to be one of the items under expenses. And the fact that they are working for us and being paid, and I'm assuming, you know, everybody's comfortable here. This is a normal kind of business we're looking at here. And uh, then, you know, they may not be happy with what they're getting, but they're obviously prepared to work and we are going to keep them as happy as they should be to optimize the profit. We don't want to pay them more than that or, or less than that, because if they're not happy, they're not going to work hard. So they're looked after. What about customers? Well, the fact that there's revenue in the income statement tells us that customers are buying our product, our services, they're happy. If uh, maybe they could be happier and we might want to tweak those things, but right now customers are, you know, they're being paid in a sense, they're getting value for money. What about managers? Well, but like employees, they're going to get salaries and that's part of expenses. Suppliers, well, they're obviously happy because cost of sales is part of the income statement and it's showing what we should be paying them and the fact that they're still supplying us is good news so they're covered what about operations well that's again in expenses all the operating costs are going to be there now what about the bank well the bank must be happy because they we know how much we've borrowed from the bank we're going to pay them interest and so they're covered in the income you know the income statement is catering for them so and so is the government we are morally and legally uh, required to pay taxes to the government. And uh, so, you know, all of these stakeholders, in a sense, are shown, reflected in the income statement. But the, the thought, the idea here, here is often that, well, what's left, the net income, is what the shareholders want. It's what the shareholders get, but it's not necessarily what they should get. And that's the key issue here. The other issue, of course, which I don't really want to talk too much about is, well, what about society? Should businesses be doing more than what is legally required? Should they be helping the community and, and so on? And there might be some uh, marketing incentive to do that. Um, you know, it could help you sell and, and so on. But if you're a Milton Friedman fan, he's going to tell you, no, the business of business is business. Don't, beyond paying your legal requirements, the shareholders, if they want to help society, should do that out of their own pocket, out of the dividends, the profit that they're getting out of the business. And businesses should not be engaged in anything beyond what they have to do in terms of taxes. And if they do, they will become uncompetitive and that is no good for the economy. But that is all a separate debate. The key issue we're focused on is, well, what about the now, we need to include the balance sheet. And as you can see, the business has assets. 
which are funded by shell defense and bank loans, the debt. And you will realize that what we did just now to work out the interest that you have to pay is we took the amount of debt that the bank has lent us and we multiplied that by the interest rate and that put that gave us the interest that is due to the bank. Now, we, what what the problem we have here is that having paid all of these costs, there's this idea that the shareholders have got enough. But actually, as you can see, what's left here is simply what we call a residual. It's just what remains. That doesn't mean that it's correct. It may not be enough for shareholders or it may be too much for shareholders. So what we need to do is we need. We also then need to consider what the shareholders should get. And we should do it on the same basis. We should say how much did the shareholders put in and the accountants will tell us that it's shown in the balance sheet as the book value. We would argue with that and say, well, actually, we should probably rather use the market capitalization, the number of shares times the share price, what the market currently reflects. And I have a whole video talking about that. And we need to then multiply that by an appropriate return to shareholders. Now, this always causes some issues. So we know, for example, that if the bank want, let's say, 2% in dollars, then shareholders are going to want more than that because they carry the risk of the business. And uh, so just looking at historical data, we know that there is such a thing as a market risk premium, an average extra return that shareholders typically have received for taking on shareholder risk. Now, we could we could spend a lot of time talking about this, which we won't. But on average, what we know is that for the market as a whole in the US, that market risk premium is about five or six percent. So that's above the cost of debt. So this number might be about, let's say, for an average company, say seven percent. But obviously, we can debate that a little bit and it will depend on the company and so on. So what we should do is we say we should say take the market cap times an appropriate return to shareholders, let's say 7%, and that will tell us what is due to shareholders, what they should get, what is a fair return on their investment to shareholders. And then the shareholders are happy and uh, they're getting what they should get. And if there's anything left, we call that EVA, economic value added. Now that could be a positive number, hopefully, in which case it doesn't necessarily have to go to shareholders. That may mean that you can use it in many ways. Maybe you want to help your customers a bit more. Maybe give them a better deal. Maybe you want to uh, pay, pay your employees a little bit more. So the shareholders are happy. All the stakeholders are happy, in fact. And it's great to have a positive EVA. Sometimes, unfortunately, that EVA is negative, as I will show you. So here, for example, is McDonald's. Now, you can see I'm using their 2019 uh, numbers from their income statement, and these are in millions of dollars. So in 2019, the operating profit for McDonald's was nine, just over $9 billion. They had some debt, and uh, they had to pay interest of about a billion dollars on that, which left them with $8 billion pre-tax income. They paid about $2 billion in tax, and according to their financial statements, their net income was just over six billion dollars and you might think hooray that's wonderful the shareholders ought to be happy but what we really need to do here is we need to say okay that's a great number but let's take the market capitalization of mcdonald's and multiply it by seven percent let's see what the shareholders should get so if i do that uh, it comes to about 11.2 billion but they only made six billion so the economic value is a minus three billion. The shareholders didn't get sufficient. And so it's not surprising that if you look at McDonald's share price versus the S&P 500 index, and you can see this big dip here uh, in March, February, March of 2020 is obviously the COVID crisis. But you will observe that McDonald's is systematically underperforming the S&P index. Why? Because it is destroying value for shareholders. Negative EVA. In closing, in this final slide, I want to talk about the difference between EVA and MVA, economic value added, 
and market value added. You'll hear these two terms being tossed around whenever people are talking about EVA. Now, what I'm showing you here is a series of future EVAs. So we're in year naught, but we expect to generate some EVA in year one of let's say $220 million and 280 and whatever into the future. A bit like we do with free cash flows, but I want you to appreciate that these are not free cash flows. This is the extra value, remember, that we are generating above what the current stakeholders of the business, including the shareholders, actually require. Now, you will observe, to make the point here, that I've taken the EVA down to zero in years five and six in the future. Now, I'm making the point here because it's unlikely that a business will be able to gener generate significant amounts of EVA into the future, because if that were the case, then competitors would enter the industry and steal their lunch. So we need to understand that. But nevertheless, what we can do, and it's possible, I put a G equals naught. This is the terminal growth rate that you would normally see in a free cash flow, discounted free cash flow valuation here. But um, it could be a little bit above zero. It's possible that, you know, maybe this is 1%, just enough not to attract too much competitors, but still create value every year type of thing. So it could be there. But the point is we're going to discount the future expected EVAs, much like we do free cash flows, at the same cost of equity, notice not the WAC this time, the cost of equity, because this belongs to shareholders at the moment, and we're going to get an NPV in this case of, let's say, $841 million. I'm calling that the, the MVA, the market value added. Now, what does it mean? Well, it is technically the present value of the future EVAs, but what it represents is the extra value that is available to shareholders or anybody who comes and buys this company. If you could buy this company for its current market cap, you would be getting a good deal because it's actually worth its current market capitalization. I'm just talking about the equity portion here, plus $841 million, assuming that this is how it's gonna play out. So I hope you found all of this interesting and useful.